especially in this uh, present climate, the way things are going. Um, also in the literal climate out there. Uh, earlier on today, we were wondering whether we get snow. Uh, my children up in Cardiff all got it. But um, we were able to gather together, which we give God thanks for today. God willing, on, um, on Wednesday, we'll meet at 3 o'clock in the afternoon for our time together. This Wednesday, we're actually going to have um, a communion ser communal service. So what we've done with that, we've tried it once before on a Wednesday. And if anybody wants to join us, we, we, we ask people to bring their own bread. You don't need to bring a loaf. Just bring a little bit of bread of your own. The wine will be there, or the, the, the black or the juice will be in the glasses ready. But it saves us having to handle other people's um, bread and so forth. So if you, want, if you want to come along, and if you take your own bread, and the wine will be provided and then we have a time of prayer also on Wednesday. Next Lord's Day, we, God willing, we'll still be here at the Village Hall, same time, at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Um, there are those that are, are not well. I, I did speak to, um, I actually called it Mrs. Guest yesterday. Um, she was indisposed at the time. But Dave told me that um, she'd been out in the garden, which is, <laughs> with her sticks and splint and everything, I expect. So um, there's another accident we're going to happen, I expect, <laughs> this is guess. But um, she is actually up and about, and she is at home, for which we, we give God thanks again. Um, Muriel, again, isn't with us and um, would love to be with us, I'm sure. Uh, I had an email, uh, a, an email or a text of Angela from the, from the pub, uh, who lives behind the pub, I should say. Um, she, um, she was saying how much she's missing coming here and sends her greetings, and she, um, she's actually shielding because of uh, Keith at the moment is shielded. So uh, we remember those that cannot, cannot be here. Andrew Morgan sent me a text last night and said uh, how he's uh, missing the fellowship and, and thinking about us at this particular time again. Um, so we can pray for those who, who are unable to be, to be with us at this particular juncture. Um, we remember again the Henwood family, the funeral is on, on Friday at Zion. It's 11 o'clock at Zion. But again, the, the private funerals now, uh, very few are allowed to go. I hope to go and stand outside. But um, generally, they're, they're private funerals now, aren't they? So we can remember the, the Henwood family uh, yet again, I think, today. So let's bow our heads and let's, let's pray together. Amen. Father in heaven, we do thank you that we're gathered together again. We haven't come in the name of any church or denomination. We've come in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we've come because of what he has done and what he has achieved on our behalf. We're thankful that there's a way, as we'll see later on, Lord, that there's a way into your presence now which has been made made possible through your son coming into this world and opening up that way for us by his own death resurrection and ascension back into heaven we realize that when we pray now that we have that one seated at your right hand who intercedes on our behalf our savior and your son the lord jesus christ so we come to worship you and through him we pray lord that as we gather together we will know something of your holy spirit who promises to dwell within the hearts of his people and also to be in the midst of his church we pray that you will be with us and you'll minister to us and do our souls good as we gather together this day. We're conscious there will be other churches in our locality that will be seeking to, to, to meet under perhaps duress and difficulties. We pray that you will be with them and give blessing upon your church at this particular time. We think also of our land. We think of the, the difficulties that people are knowing at this particular time. We pray for those who are at the front line. We think of those who are having to deal in hospitals with the difficulties that they being presented with we pray that you'll give them all the wisdom and the strength that they need and for our politicians we pray for them the difficult decisions they're having to make we pray that we will uphold them before you and we long to hear of them seeking you in prayer and seeking your aid and your help father we think of those that cannot be with us today we thank you for mrs guests um, being able to come out of hospital now we just pray you'll be with her and dave and you'll watch over them and your hand will be upon them at this particular time we think again of Muriel, who would love to be here. We pray for her. We think of Angela, Lord. We commend her to you and Andrew Morgan. We think of those who would like to be here but cannot be here for various reasons. We commend them in your hands and we pray that you will minister to them in, in their particular situations. So we come seeking to worship you. We pray that you help us in our worship, that all that is said and done will be for your praise and for your glory. And we'd ask this in your name. Amen. Amen. So our first uh, hymn this afternoon is a well-known hymn, um, especially from those of us who are from the Welsh contingent, Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah.
Well, our reading is taken from the book of Hebrews, Hebrews in chapter 8. We're still going through the book of Exodus. Exodus chapter 25, possibly part of chapter 26, we'll be looking at this, this afternoon. But Exodus um, chapter 25, 26 is really summed up a lot in the book of Hebrews. So we're going to read from Hebrews in chapter 8. Now this is the main point of the things we are saying. If we have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the tabernacle which the Lord erected, and not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. Therefore, it is necessary that this one also have something to offer. For if he were on earth, he would not be a priest, since there are priests who offer the gifts according to the law who serve the copy and the shadow of the heavenly things, as Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle. For he said, See that you make all things according to the pattern shown to you all on the mountain. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry, insomuch as he is a mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. For if the first covenant had been faultless, then... No place would have been sought for a second, because finding fault with them, he says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they did not continue in my covenant and discarded them, says, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind, and I will write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. None of them shall teach his neighbour, and none his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sin, and their lawless deeds, I will remember no more. In that, in that he says, a new covenant. He has made the first is obsolete now what is becoming obsolete is growing old is ready to vanish away amen how would you gentlemen can you see that picture girls can you see what that is do you know what it is well, it's actually one of these. When you get old, you start taking up hobbies and pastimes you thought were for old people. And that's what I've done. So when Delis and I go for a walk, we have a good look. We've seen kingfishers. We've seen herons. We've seen cormorants. We've seen all sorts of different creatures. And I can now see a little Abigail. And I can see a little Molly, and I can see in front of I can see Molly chewing, and I can see Molly's two pink cans, and I can see the pencil case in front of Abigail, pink with something black on it, and there's a little Lily's head I can just see above there, and yet you're all the way back there. Yet this makes everything seem so much nearer, so much closer. If I turn it around the other way. Do you know what's going to happen? Well, where have you gone? Now I can't see you at all. So the beauty of the binoculars is when you're out walking, things which are far off come very close. And you can see how beautiful they are and how wonderful they are when things draw near. In the Bible, there's a really wonderful verse in the book of James. And it says this. Draw near to God, he draws near to you. So someone you think should be afar off from us can come very close to us. When we read his word, when we talk to him, when we live the lives that he wants us to live, he draws close. And that's really encouraging when things are difficult, when we might go through hard times, to know that we have a God who's not way off there, 
but someone who draws close to his people when they draw close to him. So these binoculars are very good at bringing things far away very close. God's word has told me that when I draw close to him, he draws close to me. Well, as I said, we're actually going to be going through those um, chapters in Exodus. I'm not going to read them this morning. They're quite long chapters, but I'd summarize them really by reading from um, Hebrews and chapter, chapter 8. But um, in some ways, what Jeremy was saying, I don't um, tie in with Jeremy. He does his own little talk, and, uh, but it, it comes in, in context of what we're talking about this morning, and this afternoon, I should say. And we're going to be talking about, and my title is, Drawing near, drawing near. God draws near to his people. Now in chapter 1 to 8 in Exodus, we've actually seen there that the Lord delivered the people of Israel from Egypt. You remember the story well. Then in chapter 19 to 24, we have this situation where the nation now, the people of God, are at the foot of Mount Sinai. And God has given them um, commands. But also God has said he's going to adopt them now as his own people. And he talks about this idea, he's going to enter into a relationship with them, which will be a covenant relationship. They will be his people, and he will be their God. Now, there are certain things we're going to think about this morning. This, I keep saying this morning, it feels like a Sunday, Sunday morning, this afternoon. But we're going to be thinking about these things. First of all, God has a plan. God has a, expects his people to contribute, so there's God's people's contribution. Talk about God's presence. God's pictures, and if we get a chance, entering into God's presence. Now that's five points this week. It was two points last week. Five points is a good um, Calvinistic um, approach. So five points we're going to be thinking about this morning. So we're thinking first of all about God having a plan in um, chapter 25 and following. And he tells us this, he has a plan, and he has this plan that he's going to dwell with his people. To dwell with his people, he's going to need a place where he can focus, or the people can focus upon him, where his glory will dwell. So he's got this plan, there's going to be a place where his people can come and they can know something of his glory. We'll see that he's, he commands the people to build a tabernacle. Later they'll, they'll build a temple. And they're going to build this tabernacle and it's going to be also organized and undertaken and everything will be carried out they will be carried out by one tribe the levites they will be the priests who will actually then um, oversee the, the the workings that will go on within this this tabernacle so he's going to build a tabernacle now a tabernacle really is a tent so it's going to be a large large tent and so the tabernacle the tent is going to be set apart for god and this tribe these people will be set apart for god and It'll be a great responsibility, but it'll be also a great privilege for the whole of the nation because God is saying he's going to draw near to them. God is saying he's going to dwell in the midst of his people. Now, in the following chapters, there, there will be many details. If we spent um, every sermon going through every detail, we'd be here till I don't know when. So we're not going to look at the, the details in, in um, these chapters that are before us. But we're going to see, really, ultimately... That God promises to dwell amongst his people. As Jeremy said, to draw near to his people. And he's going to lay down requirements for how the people are to worship him. And how this is going to fun how they're going to function. And so we're not going to get into the great detail. But we're going to see something of, of the overview, if you want. Of what God was actually going to do. To carry these things out, then he would, he would need a plan. And we know that in, in verse 8 of the chapter that we read together, God had a plan. In chapter, in chapter eight, uh, 25 and verse 8, God has a plan in Exodus for his people. Verse, tw um, verse 5, sorry, chapter 8 and verse 5, he says, Those who serve the copy and shadow of the heavenly things as Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle. So God gave him the instructions. God said, I've got a plan, and this is what I want you to carry out. This is the plan 
that I have for you. He has a plan to be able to, to bring about this structure, this place whereby he can abide in the midst of his, of his people. You see, God doesn't work off the hoof, as it were. God doesn't just say, well, that's changed. I'd better change my plan here. Things are different now. I'd better change the way I'm... God has a plan over everything. He oversees all things. He has a plan on how things are to be carried out. So he's got a plan on how this structure was to be put in place. Now, when I built my house, I, I was in industry before, as you know, and I, I was used to, to running jobs, which meant I had to order equipment. I had to get things organized. And so it was just the way I had to do jobs. So when I came to build my house, I was always ahead of the game. So I always, was made, I always made sure we had the materials ordered, I had the, 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 the subcontractors, whoever they were, in place. And amazingly, I managed to get the house up in 10 months. Because I'm, I'm not generally overly organised, but in those sort of things, I can, I can organise things and, and get things done. Well, God had a plan. This is what you must do. This is what's to, to carry out. So he had a plan for the tent, for the tabernacle. God has a plan for his church. So throughout the whole of history, God has had a plan that he always have a people for himself. And he tells us in Philippians in chapter 2 and verses 12 to 13, there, God works in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. In other words, when God begins to build his church, as we come into the New Testament, he's got a plan. It's not just happening by chance. Everything is in control. He's working through his people. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10 reminds us he has a plan for our lives. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared before how we should walk in them. So God has a plan for his people, for his church, for individuals, for our lives. The Bible tells me this. Do you know, God is building his church. He's got a plan. So things aren't going the way we like in our country regarding the church. But I believe God has a plan. God is in control. So when we look at Moses, when we look at the, the people of Israel, even when we look at our own lives, if we put our faith in Christ, we believe he's got a plan for our lives. He knows what's best. He teaches us and he directs us in the ways in which we should go. So God had been with Israel since they left Egypt. And he had a plan. And now he had this plan that he was going to actually be seen dwelling amongst the people themselves. So in verse 8, he promises that he's going to dwell amongst his people. He instructs Moses to make this sanctuary. He instructs him to, to make this place whereby he can dwell with his people. God promises to be with his people. Now as Christians, we sometimes struggle with that. We sometimes struggle with the concept, God has a plan for our lives. Now, the Bible actually tells me this. Everything works together for good to those who love God. Those who put their faith in Jesus Christ. Things are working out for the good of God's cause and for his people. Now, what we find is when things are going wrong in our lives, we can't understand it. How can God have a plan? Why can he, how can he allow this to happen in my life? God has a plan. He had a plan for the children of Israel. He had a plan where he was going to dwell with them. He's got a plan for his church. He's got a plan for our lives if we have our faith in him. He has a plan. Secondly, what he's got also, he's got this, this idea that the people of God, that we must be those who contribute to his plan. God's people have a contribution. So in verse 2 of, of the... Of, um, Chapter 25 of Exodus, in verse 2, we read this. Speak to the children of Israel that they bring me an offering for everyone who gives it willingly with his heart shall take me or take my offering. So God expects his people to contribute to his plan. He's encouraging his people to contribute, to put something towards this work but to do it from a willing heart. Now, to date, the children of Israel have been slaves in Egypt. They've been slaves for many, many years. Now they've suddenly become free. They, they're traveling to the promised land, but now they have to understand they have a new master, or they have a master in whom they, they should be resting. And God has a plan what he wants to do, how he wants to minister, but he actually believes that they're actually to take part in that. He has a place for them to contribute. 
He wants a place where they can come and they can worship him. But he wants it from a willing heart. We're not robots. God didn't make us so that we just react and go. And God has given us that within our own hearts. That we can say no and we can say yes. And God expects us to be those who willingly respond to what he commands. We seek to do what God, give, what God will have us to do. He wants us to, to give and he wants the people here to give so that they can give towards the worship of God. But he wants it from their heart. It means nothing if people do what they do just out of a sense of duty. God has laid down the requ requirements. In the Christian faith, this is what we believe. We believe that God actually works within the hearts of people. He starts by doing this. He starts by making us aware of our failings and our sin. We call it actually conviction of sin. That's where God starts. He starts in our hearts and he convicts us that what we are is that we are not right in the presence of God. So God starts in our heart. Before ever we come to faith, he starts to make us aware of our failures and our failing. And then he points us to Jesus Christ who met the standard that we could never meet. And we put our faith in him. And then what he wants from us is those who serve him with a willing heart. So he moves our hearts. He wants us to do what we do for his glory. So here in this particular section, God through Moses is laying down the requirements of what he wants. What he wanted from his people. He wanted them to provide the material to build the tabernacle. David prays in 1 Chronicle chapter 29 and verse 14. He said, everything comes from you and we have given you all what comes from your hand. In other words, David says, Lord, I give you what I give you, but actually I'm just giving you what you gave me. That's what David is saying. He's giving back what God had provided. He's saying thank you to God and he wants to give God the honor and give him the right place in everything in his life. Now, Harvest Festival, we didn't have this year, or last year. And Harvest was a time when people would stop, they'd reflect, and they would say, God's been good. He sent rain, he sent sun, the plants have grown. And we want to show our response by having a service whereby we give something to say thank you to God. And it was something that became part of our tradition, that people would contribute something and bring them to the, to the church to show, just to show pictorially really how they want to give thanks to God so God wants them to contribute to this work he wants them to come willingly he wants them to give something so that they can be able to contribute to this work in the church what we can do is this we can press young people we can give people a, a sense of awkwardness now I've said it before but I, I've spoken to many people in the village over the years and I've invited people to the chapel and actually, some people have come. And after two or three visits, they get the idea this man goes on too much, and they decide not to come again. And what I say to them before they come is this. I say, if ever you want to come along, you're more than welcome. If you come, I will not hound you after you've been. So I don't go there looking to get on to them and say, why aren't you coming now? Because if I get them to come, and I pressurize them to come, all I've done is pressurize them to come, and they've come to please me. So we, we're not about pressurizing people. God says, I want them to do this willingly. When children are being brought up, we had six, as you know. They all came to church. They all came to Sunday school. They all went. Because they had to. They had not that much say in the matter. They had to go along. But then they get to an age where they've got to go because they want to go. It's got to be something which is willing within their own hearts. So we don't pressurize them any longer. It's their decision, isn't it? So the people were to make a contribution. In verses 3 to 7, we have the list required there of the project, what they were to bring in Exodus chapter 25. He said, look, we're going to need materials. You people need to bring the materials. They needed gold, they needed silver, they needed bronze, they needed blue, purple, scarlet materials, they needed fine linen, they needed goat's hair, they needed ram's hair, they needed uh, a say of wood, they needed oil for lighting the the, the lights and for anointing and for fragrance. They needed costly stones. They needed an array of stuff. And God gave the plan to Moses. This is what the people need to contribute. 
And this was going to be a costly project. They just left Egypt. They were slaves. But if you remember back in Exodus chapter 12 and verse 35 and 36 there, when they left, his, when they left Egypt, the people gave them, gave them gifts, gave them possessions. Whether it was just to get rid of them, to get them out at last or whatever because of the plagues. They gave them possessions and they took some, some treasures with them. In chapter 17, they had a great battle. They won a battle. They kept the spoils of the battle. So suddenly, these people who had been slaves, they had things at their disposal. So, here we have these people. They're traveling through the wilderness. They suddenly got some things. But now God is saying, I need from you certain things. To facilitate this project, to be able to meet with you for worship, you have to contribute to this. And the worship was going to be costly because they'd have to give towards what had to be given, what had to be done. And worship can be costly. Not financially, although obviously the church is going to be provided for. But sometimes it means that we've got to put ourselves out. We've got to make the extra effort. We've got to come where we feel like we don't want to come. We go, because it requires effort. It requires determination. And these people are going to have to be willing now to give and to give of themselves. That's why the hymn writer wrote those words. He said, take my life and let it be consecrated Lord for me. Take my moments and my days. Take my silver, take my gold, take my time. Take The hymn writer says, take everything. Because ultimately, like David said, it came from your hand in the first place. So, God had a plan. God had a plan, and his plan was going to involve the contribution of his people. And God was going to be in their presence. In verse 8, God is telling Moses... Let them make a sanctuary for me to dwell in. So I can be in their midst. Now these people were nomads. In other words, they were travellers. They were travelling through the wilderness. And he says, I will be with you. And I'm going to dwell in a tent or a tabernacle. And that's an amazing thought because this is the God of the universe. The God who made all that is to be seen. And at this point in, his his, in history, he's saying, I'm going to presence myself in a tent in the midst of some nomads, some travellers. I'm going to have this place, which is going to be a sacred place. The people can contribute to it. It's not going to be a cathedral. It's going to be a tent. And it shows the great condescension of God that he was going to come into the midst of the people and he was going to be in a tent. He's saying, basically he's saying, I want to be where they are. That's what he was saying. You see, God is not a God who is far removed from any of us. He's a God who wants fellowship with people. He's a God who wants interaction with us. He's a God who wants to be with his people when they gather to worship him, wherever they worship him. He wants to be with us. He wants to be our God. And he wants us to make him to be the one that we worship. And all that's going to happen in these verses is going to point to the fact that God is actually not only going to dwell in a tent, he's going to dwell one day amongst his people in his son. John chapter 1 and verse 14 says that, that Jesus Christ became flesh, and the word is, he tabernacled, he dwelt amongst his people. In other words, Jesus came from heaven and he pitched his tent right in the middle of his people. He became flesh to be amongst his people. So the tabernacle was where God was going to dwell in the camp of Israel. It was going to be the place of meeting God. And when we get to the New Testament, Jesus says, you see, no one can come to the Father but through the one who's tabernacled with you, through me. He was saying, it's not just going to be a physical place, it's going to be a spiritual one where we're going to meet with God, not in a tent, we're going to meet with God in the Lord Jesus Christ. So the tabernacle reminds us that Jesus Christ came and he tabernacled amongst us. So what God does, he uses pictures in these particular um, illustrations that we've got. First of all, he, he's given a plan. Now here's a picture, I hope I've got, there we are, something well done. A picture of the plan of the tabernacle. Now it's, a, it's, it's, 
I was one of my worst subjects in school was tech drawing. I used to do um, what was it like symmetric drawings or whatever. You, know, you always had a plan view, and I don't. I was the worst at doing. Te te was my worst subject in school. I was just too untidy. But this is actually a plan view, isn't it? It's a plan view of what they were they were to build. And he tells them this that here is where I'm going to dwell amongst you. Here's the pictures I'm I'm going to use. He says there's a tank te um, a tent. It's going to have three divisions to it. So. There's going to be three areas to that tent. He says there's the outer court. You see it says in the bottom left-hand corner there. There's the outer court. Now there the people could come in who were in their tents. They could actually come to the outer court. Then there was the holy place, the second part, as you step in there. And that's where these priests would do their work. They'd carry out their duties. But then there is that place that's the most holy place. Now that's where God was going to meet. And only one person could go in there, and he could only go in there once a year. He could go in on the Day of Atonement, and he would be the high priest. And he would go into this special place. And in this special place, there were various things. In the special place, there was the Ark of the Covenant, which was a picture, really, of, of what, was, what God was going to have for his people, and how he, how he was going to meet with his people. There was this... this box if you want and it was to be made of, of uh, um, this particular wood a sayer wood I can't, pronounce, I can't quite pronounce that acacia, acacia wood that's what it is acacia wood and it's going to be a certain dimension I, I'm usually thinking imperial but I'll give you the metric equivalents he's going to give you the, the dimensions Moses to make this box this, this arc it's going to be 1.1 meters long 70 centimetres wide and 70 centimetres high. That's the, size, that's the size of it. It's going to be overlaid in gold inside and out. It's going to have four rings attached to it so that nobody has to touch that when it's moved. They can have the poles already there and they can carry the poles. No one must touch the ark. And so no one must come and actually put their hands on it. Inside the ark, inside the ark there was to be a tablet of stone where God had written down his, his laws. And it was to be that, 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 within that within that ark was going to be various things. The cover was going to be gold. And the cover was going to be what we call the, the mercy seat. Over the ark was going to be two cherubims. You can see the picture there of the cherubims. They've got their, their um, wings coming over the top of the, the ark. And inside the ark... As I said, there was to be the, the tablets of stone, which had the commandments. There was also to be a pot whereby they put the, the manna, which was God gave the people to be fed with from heaven. And there was also to be the rod that, that Aaron had, which, which budded. And so inside there was these, these articles. Then once a year, the high priest was to go into the holiest place. He was to take the blood of of a, an, a sacrifice that was made and he was to sprinkle that blood on the mercy seat. That's where the sacrifice was to be made. That's where atonement was to be made. And that was where God's people once a year would know that their sin had been atoned for. The ark, the mercy seat, was to be the place where God was going to say, again, they're that one with me. They were to remember they were once in bondage but God had saved them, and now they were released. And what actually happens was, in the New Testament, all these pictures that God had given were pointing to the fact this was going to be fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ. Because he would become the one who would make atonement for our sins. He would be the one whose blood would be shed. He'd be the one who Moses was looking to, and the high priest would look to on that great day. He would be the one, and we used that big word last week, who would be the propitiation for our sin. In other words, he would be the one who would take the wrath of God for our sin upon himself and divert it from us. So we could know mercy and we could know forgiveness. The high priest would go in once a year on behalf of his people to make atonement. In Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 11, Christ came as high priest of the good things to come, with greater and more perfect tabernacle, 
not made with hands, that is, not of his creation. So all these pictures, the tabernacle, the, the Ark of the Covenant, the priest, the blood, the atonement, all that was a picture of what Jesus was to complete. Now if we put our faith in Jesus Christ, what we realise is this. We realise our sins have been dealt with, but unless you're different than me, you feel inadequate. Sometimes you feel I'm not worthy to be called a follower of Jesus Christ because I fail and I, I do things wrong. But then what we do is this as Christians, we look to our heavenly mercy seat. We look to where Jesus went ahead and he has provided the blood that was spilt to cover our sins once and for all. We know that God has been satisfied with the sacrifice for our sins. So although we fail, we know that he never failed. And we look to what he has done, which is never to be repeated again. No more priests every once a year coming in. No, when Jesus came, that was it. Our confidence now is that we can enter into the holiest place. We can come into the very presence of God himself. So, entrance into God's presence. The priests, well, they could work in the outer court. In the outer court, we've got a picture of, of the outer court coming up somewhere. Do we have one of the, with the candlesticks? That's looking good to me, Kylie. Well done. I'm seeming like I'm very in control here at the moment. But it's all down to Kylie. So we've got, we've got this, this picture now of the symbols, the things that are in that particular place. So in the outer court, we see as they go into the outer court, there's the golden lampstands. There's the altar of incense. There's also a curtain that separates the holy place from the holiest of holies. We find that there's the, the Ark of the Covenant, which has been covered in gold and so forth. There's the, 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 the table that's been placed there in, in that particular place. There's the table, and it's been again made of the same wood. It's got the rings on it so that it can be carried with, with poles. And on the table, there's always 12 loaves. There's always 12 loaves of bread. And the reason is, every week, 12 loaves are put on, in on the table. On the Sabbath day, they take the 12 loaves and they pass them to the priests so they can eat them. I'd now stay they were, but that's what they did. After, after the week was over, on the Sabbath day, the priests would partake of the loaves. 12 loaves because there were 12 tribes of Israel. So, God was showing the people that he provides for his people. Bread, when we were growing up, Kathleen, remember, we were growing up, bread was a very much part of our stable diet. So you had bread for breakfast, you had bread for dinner, you had bread for tea. Whatever you had, you had bread with it. And, and bread was part of our stable diet. It was part of the stable diet of this people. And it was showing... Here is what God does. He provides for his people. But also pointed to something else. He, these are pictures. And it tells us in John chapter 6 and verse 35, Jesus called himself the bread of life. Whoever feeds spiritually on him, he says, will never ever hunger. In other words, the Christian believes, you see, as God Show these people, there's the bread, the provision has been there all the time for you. God will always provide for his people. He's provided for our spiritual need in Jesus Christ himself. No need to panic, no need to fear. So our faith rests in him to be the one who provides for everything we're confronted with. He knows what's before us. He actually knows what we need before we even ask what we have need of. He tells us if we seek him first and his righteousness, everything else that we need in this life he will provide. Because our God supplies all our needs according to his riches in glory. Now we're living in an age, we're living in a day which is gripped by fear at this moment. As I said at the beginning, Christians believe God is in control. We sang at the beginning, bread of heaven. The one who provided for his people will provide for his people now. God provides for our needs. 
We also see there's a candle. There's a candle there. Sorry, can we go back to that picture? There's a candle there in that in that particular part of the tabernacle, because in that part of the tabernacle there would be no natural light. They need a light in the tabernacle, and the light actually consists of seven candles. There's six um, arms coming off, isn't it? And there's the one in the centre. Seven in the Bible is the the number of perfection, and in that candle or the candelabra. There was to be continual oil. All the time the oil was supposed to be there. So there was constant light when it was needed. And it's again a symbol, a a reminder of Jesus Christ. God reminds us that Jesus is the light of the world. God is light and in him there is no darkness. Jesus says in John 8 verse 12, I am the light of the world. Who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Now there's much darkness all around us. Our politicians are telling us there's light at the end of the tunnel. But in the midst of all that's going on politically, internationally, morally, with the epidemic, whatever, the cry still going out, is there light at the end of the tunnel? It's like the tabernacle. The light of the presence of God is never, ever extinguished. His presence is known in the life of every believer. His gospel still goes forth. The light of the gospel is still going forth throughout this world. People are still coming to faith in Jesus Christ in the 21st century. Some countries is just a handful of people. In other countries, there are many, many numbers coming to faith in Jesus Christ. So... These are pictures. There's a God who provides. There's a sacrifice that is made, which is once and for all. There's light that shines into our lives and guides and directs us through all the problems of this life. And then finally, we can actually enter into God's presence. Chapter 26 of Exodus tells us the curtain would separate the people from the presence of God. Only the high priest would go in. And when Jesus was crucified, remember, the curtain was rent from the top to the bottom, which was separating the holiest of holies in the temple. Because now that's removed. There's a way in now for everybody. And this way is through Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 19 to 21. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter into the holiest. How? By the blood of Jesus. By a new and living way which he consecrated to us through the veil, that's his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God. Here's the way into God's presence now. Through Jesus Christ himself. He's the way and it's open for all to enter in. When Jesus was leaving this earth, he told his disciples, To go into all the world and bring this light of the gospel to people. And he tells them this. My presence will be with you. I will give you the Holy Spirit. Who will dwell now within you. Not in the midst of a tent. He will dwell in the hearts of people. And he says this. Surely I am with you always. Even to the end of the earth. Or the end of the age. What was carried out by high priests. In the sanctuary has been carried out once and for all by Jesus Christ our Saviour. And in heaven, we don't have to put our trust in a high priest to make sacrifices. In heaven we have a great high priest who offered himself once and for all for for the atonement of our sins. We can come with our praise, we can come with our prayers, we can come with our confession, we can come with the desire to know him in our lives because he has made this way by present in himself in the midst of this world. Jesus Christ became flesh and tabernacled, tented amongst humanity. So they could just remove this place, this tabernacle once and for all, because we can come into the very presence of God. God draws near to those who draw near to him. God has a plan. He's had a plan from the beginning of the world. For his people, for his church, for people who put their faith in him. God expects his people to contribute to his work. 
be it financially, be it with our time and our energy and our work, he wants us to contribute. God's presence is in the midst of his people, but not in the tent. He dwells in their hearts. God has given us pictures to show that there was the sacrifice. Jesus is that sacrifice. There's the provision. There was bread. There's the light of the world, Jesus Christ. And we can all enter into God's presence in and through him. Amen. Let's close with singing this final, well, by listening and humming, whatever you do, to this final hymn, Nearer, Still Nearer. Let's pray. We're amazed, Heavenly Father, that you have dealings with people like ourselves. We thank you that in your Son and our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, you entered into this world, you tabernacled amongst mankind, so that there would be a way whereby we could enter into your presence one day. One day forever, but up until then, we can commune with you directly. We thank you for the blessed work of your Holy Spirit. We pray that we each know what it is to have rested in you and know you abiding in our hearts and helping us to travel this scene of time. We ask that you guard us from the troubles that are ahead, 
Help us to rest in the confidence that you have a plan and realize, Lord, that you work out your purposes. So bless us and keep us, we ask. For we ask this in the name of our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.